With over half of enterprise security budgets going towards detection and response in 2020, the challenge is investing in solutions that can migrate and scale with your business. ExtraHop helps security teams spot threats up to 95% faster and respond 60% more efficiently in hybrid and multi-cloud environments with cloud-native network detection and response. Kick the tires in the full product demo at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from zero to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome back to Business Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman, joined by Paul Asadorian and Jason Albuquerque. Join the Security Weekly mailing list for webcasts and virtual training announcements and to receive your personal invite to our Discord server by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe and click the button to join the list. We got about 750 people plus in our Discord channel and lots of fun interaction during all these uh, live webcasts, including the last segment. In our first July webcast, you will learn how to stitch and enrich flow data for security use cases with Viavi Solutions. Register for our upcoming webcasts or virtual trainings by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts or visit securityweekly.com forward slash on demand to view all of our previously recorded webcasts and virtual trainings. Gentlemen, the articles are gonna tie very closely to the discussion we just had on the last segment with, with Juan and Matt. Um, but I thought the first one was really, really interesting, Jason, because this first article talks about the profile of the post-pandemic CISO <laughs> and some of the uh, new responsibilities that are gonna fall on the CISO's plate. So I'm curious, any of these yeah. on your plate? Our lives will never be the same, Matt. They'll never be the same. Now, honestly, I mean, you know, I, I, we talked about it and we hinted on it in the in the last segment is, you know, the, the business is coming to the security team more and more, um, you know, during this this pandemic and, and our responsibilities are growing. Right. I mean, the article hits on it pretty well. Um, everything from physical security and getting deeper into that things, you know, things my team has been involved in, things like contact tracing. Uh, researching the security around any type of testing devices or automation there, getting involved in policies and protocols on the HR side, right, with work from home. So, so they're really starting to bring us more and more um, in, into, the, into the higher level business decisions and strategies, which is absolutely great. You know Outside what? of the traditional security and compliance um, type type engagements that we're used to. And you know what's interesting? Um, you know, when we spoke with Heather Adkins, she talked about having site reliability engineers or reliability engineers. I'm yep. wondering how that transfers into the higher level executive positions because it sounds like now there's a lot of overlap between the security office, right, and all of the functional teams and business continuity or business reliability, Right. And so resilience. I've, I've been coining it business resilience, Paul. Yeah. So because, is there like you know, a business people, resilience officer that. Yes. Right. Can kind of work very closely with security. But I think this is a, a new discipline in in my mind. I, I think you're absolutely right, because, again, we're getting more involved in BCDR, physical security. Mm, right. Tied to HR. Like, a, you know, I just said contact tracing. I mean, when would a security team be involved in contact tracing in the, in, in the past? Right. So, I mean, it's a scenario where we're very well equipped to be able to re adapt to these new scenarios and, 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 you know, bring the business good strategies around, around how to handle this. So I've been coining it and, you know, business resilience and, yeah. and really the security and compliance teams have been really thrown at that. And, and, and asked by the business to come up with solutions. I think right. I think it's great, but the responsibilities are becoming bigger and bigger for-, for Yeah, and I think the larger the organization gets, that may deem a separate department, but Good. it may also be a sub-department inside of security in, in smaller organizations. You know, I think back to um, when a lot of the protests and riots were at their peak, mm -hmm. threat intelligence was being used to track that in a business continuity sense. Is my business going to have to shut down 
Uh, same thing with quarantine, right? And the things that yep. happened with COVID-19. It's all about preserving the business, using intelligence to, to funnel that through. That was something that I, I didn't realize how far the tentacles went out, right? In a lot of yeah. uh, threat intelligence programs that can help feed not just physical security, but also that speaks to business continuity very much so. Yeah, no, no, agreed. You know, I, I think because we were so involved in the recovery side mm. of, of security incidents, um, and, and having that ability to have a really tight incident response process, I think that allowed us to kind of eke our way into that that business resilience mode, and and we were the you know the most equipped to do it. Yeah, and I think resilience is a very interesting term compared to business continuity and disaster mm-hmm. recovery, which are yeah. you know older, kind of more boring things. Yeah, and and it's not that Stuff business continuity, yeah. right? Yeah. It's <laughs> it's not that business continuity is not important. Don't get me wrong. Keeping the business resilient in a time of drastic change, which is what we're in, is much more apropos, I think, from a naming perspective than continuity. And it's it's more it encompasses a wide wider variety of disciplines, right? Because you're talking about uh, business continuity, disaster recovery, uh, metrics and reporting, regulations and laws, right? I mean, um, you know, helping with with operating models, continuous improvement programs, doing business impact analysis. I mean, there's there's so many di- crisis management, right? Mm-hmm. I, I think I said on one of these shows, uh, you know, COVID actually had me go into FEMA's website looking at emergency response procedures, right? Right from from the federal government and really fine tuning emergency response. My mentality around emergency response. So, you know, I, I think it, it, it's broadened our horizon. So that just ties into the second article, five mistakes that threaten infrastructure, cybersecurity, and resilience. Um, this one is a little more slanted towards some identity and privilege access yeah. in, in its article, but there are some definitely interesting uh, mistakes here to avoid, I think, sure. as we think through kind of the crisis and what's happening from a budget shift. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think the key piece that I took out of this, you know, aside from the, the plugs and the, the little marketing pieces of it was, you know, budgets are getting cut. There's no doubt about it. And, it, you know, if you don't have a good relationship or, if, you know, with, with the, the, the folks who determine the funding levels, um, you're going to have some hard decisions to make. Right. So so I think it, you know, it, it behooves of the security leadership to really bring ROI in total cost of ownership to the table and really bring that discussion about how security can bring either a competitive advantage, operational efficiencies. This is the opportunity to start having the business conversation, right? Because budgets are going to get cut and it's all about how you maximize those dollars to get the best benefit in the end. And you have to be able to sit in front of your leadership and make the case for why you want these investments. Mm -hmm. And I think you've got an interesting position as both the CIO and the CISO, yeah. where point number three, where a lot of organizations are going to run into the CISO reporting to the CIO budget conflict, yep. really come into play. And how do you, as a CISO, really justify how security can actually benefit the organization when you're losing on the IT spend side? Exactly, right? And again, I think coming to the table with things like how is security going to bring competitive advantage to the table, right? I, we've talked about it on, uh, on the show before. Um, you know, I, I don't like being a cost center. I, I, you know, that's, that's just been, um, you know, my mentality since I, I, I started in any type of IT leadership position. I'm always looking to align the business and show the differentiator of my department and how it adds value. So, so coming in with, hey, listen, we may need X amount of investment, but here's the pull through by, by having that investment. Here's how we're going to better the business. Here's how we're going to get more opportunities. Here's how we're going to make security a differentiator. Here's how we're going to gain trust with our customers. You, you know, we really have to start having those kind of conversations in order to preserve the budget. Yeah. Third article hits on the same thing, uh, theme, time to rethink business continuity and cybersecurity. I mean, yeah. they actually point out you know, how do you bring these two disciplines together? You know, before I was officially in security back in 96, I was more on the continuity side. Mm. And I, I, it was funny because I'd worked in both nuclear power plants and, and also in oil and gas for a period of time. That was my early IT career. And my project that I had before I went into security, this was the project right before I got into security in 96, 
was I built the business continuity disaster recovery plan for one of the large refiners down in, mm-hmm. in New Orleans. And you, that was a very big part of plant operations was the business continuity disaster recovery side of the equation, right? If a hurricane came up the Gulf and wiped out the plant, what'd you need mm-hmm. to do to get refining back online? It was, it was a huge business critical activity sure. that we kind of forgot about for a while. And then you have security goes off on its path. And now you're starting to see this reemergence of how do you integrate these two disciplines back together? Because any attack could create an outage of some sort that has to be planned for and, and resolved quickly. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, disruption can come in many forms, right? Disruption to the business, and this is why I keep talking about business resilience, disruption to the business can come in natural disaster, right? It can come in a a, a business-type scenario where, let's say, you fail an audit, right? Or it could come in a ransomware attack. I mean, think about it. Throw in a ransomware attack to your story. It could have brought down the entire plant. So this is where we're starting to, like I said, converge. We're all starting to converge in. It just gives you, you know, it talks about some of the restructuring and some of the alignment that you're going to have to do, people, process, et cetera. It's a yep. decent article. I thought it was interesting. It's it's on this whole theme of response and resilience. And it's just interesting how the last segment and these first three articles really kind of uh, align yep. that discussion. Yeah. Uh, the other one we've been talking about, remote work, uh, set to remain, um, but so do management challenges. And this is interesting. This was a, a survey that was done. Uh, 2,200 businesses globally, including 500 in the UK, by Robert Walters. And what you're seeing is kind of these mixed reviews of what employers want versus what employees yes. want. Yeah. And and I thought the stats were pretty interesting here because the business are like, no, 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 we want at least half of our workforce back, right? right. In, in, on site, on premise, uh, 57% of senior leadership prefer traditional ways of working. But on the employee side, it's like no 87% want to stay yeah. in some remote capacity. There is a disconnect in and, organizations right now. And, and I swear it comes down to that hot topic of the last segment. It's productivity, right? I, I think leaders need to be more comfortable in how they're managing metrics around productivity to show the product so they feel comfortable with the remote workforce, right? I mean, w- with my team, I have... I have the utmost confidence that my team is productive because we measure things like, um, you know, our, our, our incidents, our tickets, our, our projects. I mean, we're, we're managing projects like a PMO team, right? So, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I have the utmost confidence in, in, in the metrics for my team being productive. Does every other manager? Because the number here, 64% are concerned, of leaders are concerned with employee productivity. That's a lot. That's a lot of leaders concerned with employee productivity. I, I think it's eventually going to plateau, right? I think we see, you know, on the graph, we see this really high percentage of people mm-hmm. working from home. I don't think it's going to dip back down, you know, at or below where it was. There's going to be some plateau yeah. and where it makes sense. People are still going to work from home. And, uh, you know, eventually as time goes on, uh, you're not going to see this kind of drastic uh, work from home experience. Yeah. Yeah. But, but and, and again, I mean, I think I think with a little bit of investment in, in the article kind of touches on a little bit and a little bit better technologies and analytics around the workforce and around their productivity and and that visibility to the leadership may add a level of comfort. Right. And I think that's the point, Jason. There has to be a level of comfort yeah. with how to measure productivity in a remote workforce yes. and understand and, and get comfortable with those metrics and in yeah. whatever shape they take, right? That 100%. ties into this. Yeah. And that it ties into this next article, uh, protecting remote workers, productivity and performance, right? Mm-hmm. Part of the onus is actually on the management team, the leadership team to make sure that you're engaged. You're still making those connections with the employees that you're not allowing them to continue to distance themselves in the, in, in, in the workforce, because when that happens, the stats that are in this next article talk about how innovation and other things drop just off the charts yeah. when that virtual distancing happens. And I think it's it requires the leadership, right, 
to make the effort to continue to figure out how best to engage with the remote right. workforce to keep productivity high. Oh, 100%. I mean, at the end of the day, we're humans and we're social. So, so we need to have that aspect of our work life. Otherwise, it's not balanced, right? And, and, and at the end of the day, I mean, these stats are scary, right? I mean, when, when folks become disconnected from their teams, from their colleagues, from the workforce, um, you know, the, the term super stressor was used. And if you look at some of the stats there, you know, innovation, productivity, uh, you know, ability for collaboration, project success, all those things go down astronomically. So, yeah, it's our job as leaders to make sure we're keeping that level of social connection, right? I mean, I'll tell you, with meetings with my team, I very rarely start the meeting with conversations about business out of the gate. It's, it's hey, you know, how's everything going at home? How, how are people doing? How's, how are things in your state compared to our state? You know, what's, what's the news in, in Texas? What's the news in Connecticut or New York? And it's, it, it's really just making that, that, that personal connection again. Um, that, that you could have had in an office or when people were able to travel and come visit. I mean, even if you met, you know, physically with folks once a quarter, you still had that opportunity to go out to dinner, have lunch together, have that social interaction where you could connect. Yeah. I, you know, the one that was really scary is trust declines by more than 80% when those other stats. Yeah. And to your point, I think this is all about engagement and, and how you engage. And, and when you engage, spend that first five, 10 minutes. Absolutely. Hey, how was your weekend? How are, how, how are the kids? How are you hanging in there? What's going on? It's interesting that all the conversations revolve around some aspects of where are you? What's your environment? Because the, it, the environment's so different location to location, even in Colorado, for example, Mm -hmm. What downtown Denver is experiencing is very different than what I'm experiencing down here closer to the Springs. And we're in the same state. So there's so much variation and it, it, it's a way to just kind of, you know, talk to people and understand kind of yeah. how are things going? What's the situation like? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And I mean that, you know, that trust declines by more than 80%. You're absolutely right. That's probably the worst metric because once the trust is eroded, it's so hard to get back. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the hardest things to be able to, to, to pull back within a team. So, yeah, I mean, do do the diligence, do, you know, do the things or try your best to do the things that you would normally do if, if folks weren't 100 percent remote. I mean, you know, my my team jumped on and, and, and we watched the, the, the SpaceX launch together. You know what I mean? Where we didn't have to. It was after hours. It was you know? so. Right. But that's that's the type of stuff. Just those little things matter. Yeah. And, you know, I think the good news for, for me and Paul, at least at Security Weekly, is we, we meet with the team. I mean, we have normal, regular scheduled meetings. Remember, mm -hmm. three weeks out of every month, I was remote anyways. I just mm -hmm. haven't been able to take the fourth week and, and get to Providence and, and be in studio. But we still have those meetings. So the good news is we are interacting with the employees throughout the week and we're continuing, you know, to make sure that that the needs and of our employees are taken care of. So we've been in a position like that, but if you weren't in that mode already, it's hard to schedule the time, schedule those meetings and have that interaction. Yeah. You're, you're, you're changing your schedule. You're changing your tactics, mm -hmm. but it's gotta be done in the scenario. It's gotta be done. Yeah, definitely. Uh, last article, we talked a little bit about this last week around negotiating skills. Uh, this one is very focused on tactics for CISOs. I thought the title was a little interesting because I think, these would work regardless of which leader you are oh, yeah. in an organization. I don't think they're necessarily just for the CISO. No, right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely um, any type of management level. I mean, you're, you're going to be one of, one of the key ones for me is recognize it's negotiation, not a debate. Right. And that's, that's working with a team for, to achieve a goal, to achieve a, an, an outcome. Right. So, um, you know, I, I thought that was a great one to take back. Don't work. Well, don't walk into meetings think you're. It's a debate. Thinking that you have to, you know, shore up your posture and be on the defense to defend something. When when you're working with business units, you know, it's 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 the art of negotiation. It really is. It's it's let's come up with a solution that fits the needs and gets you to an outcome. And I think that one ties in with the last one actually, which is don't aim to win. Yes. Because if you win wholly, then somebody's going to lose. Somebody's right. Losing. And I think. Right, exactly. And in a negotiation, you're trying to create the win-win scenario, right? And yeah, so right. I think the first one and the last one really tie it together for me is 
recognize it. It's not a debate. It, there's not a winner and a loser. You want to come yeah. up with a, 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 a an agreement yeah. that yeah, both I mean, sides. I- I looked at that. It's all about the definition of win, right? Because if we're on the same team, we're winning together, but don't, don't have a confrontational win. Like I'm personally going to win this debate, right? Against another business leader or another, another manager or another peer, another colleague. I mean, if, if we're in the same company, we're on the same team, we need to be going toward the same goal, the same outcome. But that's a great point, Jason, because I think a lot of the works on, uh, looking at negotiations don't look at it from an internal organizational perspective right if you're in a negotiation to buy or sell something trade some good or service that's between you as an individual and some other individual that you have no idea maybe who they are if you're buying a house mm-hmm. right things like that the negotiation tactics are very applicable to those situations when you get internally you've got uh, yeah. an advantage and one tactic that I always use is to have the meeting before the meeting happens, right? You go to the people yeah. who are signed up for the meeting and you talk with them. What If I were to propose this, what would your objectives be and why? Yep. And what's most important to you that you need so that we can come to some sort of compromise, right? Have those discussions before the meeting happens, right? right. Mm-hmm. It was always something I learned very yeah, early on. Try to apply that as much as possible. That's the collaborative mentality, right? You didn't go into yeah. it thinking you're buying a car and you need to, you know, cut $10,000 off of that bottom line because, you know, you want to save as much money as possible. At the end of the day, you're going in there saying, I want a good outcome. So I'm going to, I'm going to have conversations with all of the different stakeholders, number one, to show them that I care. And, and, and number two, to accept their feedback and take their feedback. So that way you can come to the meeting with a good strategy and a good solution. And, and that's, you know, it's actually that piece that they hide from you when you buy a car because you mentioned it, Jason, right? They hide their true intentions, yeah. their true incentives, right? I mean, in every sense of the word, um, to, to figure out what they want, right? You've got to research it and figure out generally what maybe car dealers want to negotiate mm-hmm. something like purchasing a car. Internally, I, I can go to, you know, Bob and HR and Mary and finance and say, Hey, I want to propose this. Like, what do you, what do you think? Right. Like, what would, you know, yeah. let's work together as a team. And then when we get in the meeting, we've all thought about it a little and can have a better outcome as a team. Like you said, Jason. Yeah. And, and that ties into one of the other ones, Paul, it's, it's, in, it's envision what you want, but when you read past that, it's with the caveat and it says, define what success looks like for me and all the parties involved. Right. Yeah, and it's understanding what everyone else's goals are, right? right. And success means for them. Mm-hmm. Success right. for the the finance team is, you know, completely different, right? They're like I, number one thing on their mind. What is it? You got to figure that out first before you can start right. negotiating any kind of security, right? Their number one goal is to make sure my numbers are accurate and make sure I meet my deadlines for X, mm-hmm. Y, and Z. How do I help them do that better and more securely? You got it. That's why that preparation is so important. That's why I asked you the first mm-hmm. question the first day. I was at Tenable, Paul. What do you think about this, right? And yeah, you gave exactly. me the. Yeah, I did that. Yeah. Yeah. We, I wanted to know, right? right? What Somebody would be the reaction was... if we did XYZ? Hmm, that's interesting. Let's brainstorm that for a little while, right? I mean, it's similar to threat modeling your meeting, right? <laughs> or your project. Right. Yeah. You have thoughts in your mind. You, you have an approach you'd want to take, but you need to go vet it with the other stakeholders. Yeah. And in your case, you, you, you had the Nessus product line at the, at the time, mm-hmm. and I wanted to make some major changes to it, but I had to ask before we just went and did that. Right. It worked out in the long run, so it that's did. good. Yeah, it was good. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for the news and articles today. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening, and we'll see you next week on Business Security Weekly.